Dear fellow redeemed by Christ, may, God, may Christ's grace, mercy, and peace be with you now and always. Amen. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. That is Hebrew for Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that is a phrase that the people of old would have known quite well. That is a phrase from Deuteronomy 6, chapter 4 that begins the prayer, the Shema, which is the first word, Shema Yisrael. It is that promise that God's presence would be with them, the promise that his word would dwell with them. It is the devotion of the people. In fact, so much so was this Shema important to the people of Israel that they would not only pray it when they got up, they would pray it when they went to bed. They would pray it right before someone died. It was the last thing that they would say that would touch their lips. That Shema Yisrael. Such devotion you see from the people, even to this day. The Orthodox Jews continue, when they hear those words, they literally bow their heads and they tremble. They force themselves to tremble when they hear those words. They don't even say the word Yahweh, the divine name of God, for fear of making an error. But instead, Adonai, Master, Lord, because it's so important to them. How important the word of God is to these people. How important it was that they impressed it not only upon their sons, but upon their daughters. That they made sure that it guarded their going in and their coming out. They would literally, as our scripture re- lesson said today, they would tie it to their foreheads and they would tie it to their wrists. These were what were called phylacteries. These were boxes that contained the Shema, a constant reminder of God's presence with them. Talk about importance. Talk about God's word being of value. How amazing it is and how amazing it is for us. How amazing it is for us because not only do we know the promises of God, but we have seen the fulfillment of his promises. Not only do we know that, he, that when he makes a promise, he will keep it, but we know with full assurance that through his son's death on the cross, he kept the promise of salvation, the most important promise of all. Not only do we know that Christ walks with us each day, but he will walk with us until we join him in eternity where we will never part from him. What good news we have. What a great thing for us to know. What a great thing for us to believe, to have faith, and to know that story of salvation that shows God's devotion to us. A greater devotion than we could ever show to him. God's devotion to us was meant giving of his own life, sacrificing of his own life. God's devotion to us meant making us sinners live and whole, despite who we were. And I don't know how much more the gospel can be proclaimed than knowing that Christ has made us alive. That Christ has redeemed us poor, miserable sinners. And this is something you all know. Whether it was from this pulpit, from another pulpit, whether it was recently or years and years ago, God's word has already worked in your life, hasn't it? You can think about times in their past, and times recently where God continues to work with you. Where that promise of salvation, where that promise of scripture has not only been words on a page, but has been living and breathing in your life. Think about your own life. Think about whether recently or historically, Think about how God's word has has been with you. It's a great comfort, isn't it? It's a great truth to know that God is with you, that his word is your guide in your life. So it's hard to imagine if God's word was not with us. It's hard to imagine how many people this morning are not in church. It's hard to imagine not only people who are strangers that are not in church, but even sons and daughters grandsons and granddaughters who may not be in church this morning. And as we think about those people, we know what they're missing out on. We know that from God's word that they're missing out on those promises, those hope, those, those promises of hope in this world that is dying to sin. We know that those people are missing out on the reassurance of God's grace and on God's mercy. We know that they are not hearing that their sins are forgiven. Now being a Christian is not only about going to church. Well, it is an excellent example of being faithful to God. It is not only about that, is it? Being a Christian is so much more than that. Being a Christian starts with going to church. It starts with our week, we start our week off by remembering God's Sabbath. But then we live out our faith each day. Being a Christian is about being a constant relationship with God, a daily relationship in our prayer, in our reading of God's word, and not only those prayers that we say, God, I need something, but those constant conversations with God, those constant times where we speak to him and we hear him answering us, those times where we not only open his word, but we study his word. We see exactly what he's saying to us. When 
we know God like that. We know that it is not just a Sunday morning thing, but it is a relationship that needs strengthening, needs nurturing. It is, and that relationship is not only about going to church or reading the Word, but it is about how we live. It is about what we say. It's about what we wear. It's about how we treat other people. It's about living out our faith and being the church to the world. Because as we know, as we look around, we can see that the pews are empty. We can see that there are people who are not here. We know that we have friends and relatives this morning that are choosing to sleep in instead of being in church. We know that even hardest for us, that we have our children who we raised in the church, who we instructed, who have fallen away. And I think that has to be the hardest thing. There's a theologian who said that probably one of, the hard, one of the greatest things Christian parents fear is raising their children, raising their children in the faith. And I'm sure many of you, as you've raised your children, as you've raised your grandchildren, you know that fear too well. You know how hard it is to raise them in a world today that preaches a moral relativism. And maybe you don't know that word moral relativism, but you certainly see it. It suggests that there are no absolutes. That whatever is right for you is right for you, and whatever is wrong for you is wrong for you. But don't go telling me about that. We've heard, about, heard this. We've seen this, haven't we? It seems like in our world today, this moral relativism, there's no such thing as right and wrong. It's whatever I want to do. There's no such thing as good and bad. It's however I want to live. And so we see this not only in our families, but we see this in the world around us. We see this in the communities around us where no longer do people faithfully follow God's word. The objective truth. No longer do people faithfully follow those promises of scripture. But they've turned their back. They've chosen other, other paths. And it would seem like as we look at that, it'd be downright disheartening. When we look at that, it seemed like all is lost. And there are people who have thrown in the towel who have given up the fight. There are people who have thrown in the towel and they've said, well, everything is lost. And they blame others, though. They, they point their finger and they say, it's the po- government's part. It's the television's fault. It's the Internet's fault. They may even say, no, it's the church's fault. But truth be told, Christian education begins at home. Christian education become, begins with the family. It is what we teach our children. It is what we teach our families. It is the time that we take in the example that we set. You know this because as you have been Christian parents, as you have been Christian grandparents, you know how well your children follow your example. How often they follow what you do. And when we set an example that God is not first in our lives, when we set an example that God is second or third or fourth or seventh or twelfth, our children see that. And our children witness that. And they learn that. And so we turn to God's word, though. We turn to God's word and we see a guide. We see a guide not, not by man, but by God himself. A guide for Christian parenting. A guide for us as the people of God to teach the next generation. We see a guide that God has given us and a promise. God has commanded us to love him with all our hearts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart place those commandments ever before us, to place those upon our hearts, to place those upon our children's hearts. The word in the NIV, rather, uh, is to impress them upon the heart. And when you picture that impression, picture as if you were to brand a, a bull, literally to, uh, with a brand, you burn onto the animal that symbol of, who, of, your, flo- of your flock, of your, of your herd, rather. The same is true when we impress God's word on the hearts of our children. We put it on there in indelible, that it won't come off. We each day encourage our children in faith. We each day encourage our children in belief. We each day take time to teach and to pray for our children. And this is not always perfect, is it? Because we know that even as hard as we try sometimes, even the hardest, even the the most faithful Christian, that sometimes their children's their children leave the church. Sometimes their children leave the faith. And in those times, our children especially need our prayer. In those times, our children especially need us to be faithful. But to 
times in those times they need us to pray that the Spirit might work in their hearts, that the Spirit might work in them to draw them back. But we don't, can't just throw our hands up in the air and give up. We can't just say that this is no chance, that there's nothing we can do. Because we have a God. A God who is able to defeat sin and death. A God who has created the world by the simple speaking. A God who has redeemed each one of us. We have the one true God who has shown us His grace, who has shown us His mercy, who has conquered sin and the death and the devil. And He has given us the power to do the same. He has given us the power to teach our children and to show them the right way, the right path, that there is indeed right, there is indeed wrong, there is indeed good, and there is indeed bad. And He promises us that when we teach our children, when we instruct our children, when we show them the ways, that He will bless us that he will bless us with faithful children. We go to the fourth commandment. I, I, can't, I, I hate how they've removed the ending in the modern catechism, but when Luther originally wrote it, it was, honor thy father and thy mother. And maybe some of you can remember how this ends. That it, that it may be well with you in the land that you enter. That it may go well, and it, the promise of a blessing for the children. The promise of God's blessing. That when we are faithful, that our children will remain faithful. That when we are faithful, that our children We'll seek the Lord. And even then, even then, we know that we're sinners and we will fail. Even then, we know that we, even as we are Christian people, that we'll fail. But that is why we turn not to the law, but to the gospel of grace. To the forgiveness that comes through Christ Jesus. That is why we turn to the God who is able to defeat death. That is why we turn to Him who has given us strength and forgiveness. That no matter how many failures we have made, that He has called us back, that He continues to reach down into our lives to rescue us, that He continues to lead us and continues to guide us, that even in the midst of the worst times in our lives, He walks alongside us because Jesus did not just defeat death on the cross, but He continues to defeat death each day as He walks with us, walks side by side in the lives that we live. And there is nothing that can defeat Him. There is nothing that can take away the power of the cross. And there is nothing that can stop Him. We are not a church who has given up. We are not a church that has buried our heads in the ground. But we are the people of God. We are the people of God called with a mission and a duty. We are the people of God who have been called to proclaim the gospel. To share the good news. To share that message of redemption. We are the people of God who have been called to not just be the church in one place. But to be the church. To be God to the world. To proclaim that good news. And the only way to do it is to do it, is to get out of the church building and to go, to go out there and to share the good news, to, to be among our families, whether our children are young, still being raised in our homes, or our children are older now, we still are called to lead them and guide them. And even if our children are grown, believe it or not, it's not retirement time. Even if our children are grown, we still are called to share it with the next generation, called to share that good news message. There is no retirement from the faith. I've heard so many times where people have said, I've done my job. I've raised my children in the church. I've been faithful. Now I can sit back. But that is not what God tells us to do. He tells us to honor Him, to go forth, to share that good news, to tell the next generation, to lead the next generation. And why? The why is the, the beautiful part. The why is so that all people may come to the knowledge of the truth. The why is so that all people may love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength and may know the forgiveness of sins. The why is so that all people may come to the knowledge of the truth and have salvation. The joys that we see on earth are nothing compared to the promises of salvation because faithful parents will not only see joy, the joys of, of, salva the joys of earth on earth of faithful children, but they will see the joys of of seeing their loved ones, their children, in eternity, in salvation. And that is what we look forward to. That is the promise that we look forward to from the cross. That is the promise and the hope that we have, that even in a hopeless world, that God did not give up hope in us, but continued to be devoted to us, and continued to rescue us, and continues this day, sending His Spirit to guide us and direct us. May that Spirit continue to guide and direct you. May God's Spirit continue to empower you. And at times, even when you feel like you're frustrated, like there's nothing more you can say to your children, like there's nothing more that you can say 
to the next generation. Know that God is with you. Know that God will give you the words that you need when you are, when you are without. Seek Him and He will be found. Trust in Him and, you, and, he will, and your foot will not slip. The Proverbs say, one of my favorite verses, and I share this a lot, and my ladies' Bible study is probably getting tired of it, but train up a child in the way he shall go, and he will not depart from it. How true that is. When we raise our children to be faithful to God, when we raise our children faithfully as God has commanded, they will be raised in the church. They will be raised to be part of the church and to, to receive that gift of salvation. They will receive the greatest gift of all, something greater than this earthly, uh, the earthly gift, but that heavenly gift of life eternal. May this be the strength. May this be the power. May the Spirit continue to be with you each day as you have a great duty and a great blessing to the next generation. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious God in heaven, we know that there are many different educations out there today. We know that there are many different teachings that lead away from you. We pray, Lord, that even amidst these teachings and amidst these educations, that we would seek you, that we would seek you that you might be found. Lord, we pray that we would be Christian parents and Christian grandparents who set an example for our children and grandchildren, that the way we live, the lives that we lead, would bring glory to your name. Lord, we know that even amidst that, that we fail, that we are never perfect parents because we are on this side of eternity. We know that we are sinners that, uh, that continue to need your love and forgiveness. Help us to repent. Help us to seek your compassion. Help us to seek your love and to know that it is ever available to us. Lord, reassure us that even as often as we have failed, that your forgiveness never fails, but that your forgiveness is greater and that your forgiveness is stronger that your compassion and your love will never fail. Lord, reassure us that we have a place with you. May our hope not be empty hope, but may it be true hope. True hope that one day we may walk with you in eternity. Lord, may you give us the power and strength to teach the next generation, to guide the next generation so that they too may walk with you, that they too may know the promise, and that they too may know your peace. And may we all know your great peace that transcends all belief that transcends all things. May it now guard our hearts and minds. Amen.